list of all the supplies that we have for everything related to the sheep and some of the stuff on here is just specifically for lambing. So what we're going to do is we're just going to go through the cabinet here and make sure we've got everything we need and if there's anything that we have to order we'll go ahead and make note of that. This is our lambing caddy and everything that we need for lambing is in here ready to go. We have enough of the iodine, right? Fair enough. Do we get another one of these? Yeah. Lubricant. So we're set on that. All right, cloth towels. Yep. Should we get more of those? Yep. Yes, we got uh, 60 terry towels. We usually use three and per. And what size are they? 11 by 17, I believe, something like that. They're like the biggest ones I could find. I think we should get another box of those. We usually go, yeah, definitely need one of those. Latex gloves, size extra large. I have like three quarters of a box of those over here. All right, so I need a set. Nutri Drench. Goat and sheep Nutri Drench. Which essentially, it's mostly, um, yeah, molasses is the first one, first ingredient, propylene glycol. Um, that's just to give them like a quick burst of energy until they can get on their feet, literally. Colostrum powder, which does expire. If we had any last year, we threw it out. So we don't have any colostrum. We can get that at Tractor Supply, right? I don't know. Every time I go in there, they have something different. It's usually not what I like. I'll just get rid of that. All right, so we need the colostrum powder. Milk powder we can get when we need it. We can just get that from Tractor Supply if we need that, right? So I'm not going to get that. Electrolytes, I just found this. Do more multi-species, a packet. Seems like we always use that. It doesn't expire. I think I have two bags of this. Yes. I got two bags of electrolytes. That's good. Feeding tube. All right, so we've got a good amount of those. The three of them. All right, so we're good on the feeding tubes. Plastic shot glasses. And those we're using for the triodine on the umbilical. Carol syrup, I have some in the kitchen, but we have that drenchy stuff, so we don't need it, really. Teats, I got those. Yeah. Thermometers, I have a thermometer. There's one in here right now. Okay, good. Okay, now, we need to see if we've got one of those really big syringes, like you said. Like that one, it's for uh, tooth feeding. We have this huge one, too. How come we never use that one? I don't know. I like that one. And I got some more teats here. So this one is 60 ml. This one's 140. Also very difficult to use. Okay, there we go. I like that one. All right, I just found some colostrum. So we got the syringe. All right, so then the only other thing I have is the heat lamp, which is down there, and I, I know the lamp is working. We should get a new ball for that if they sell them separately. All right, LA-200. That does expire. We have an LA-200 here. This is just sort of our penicillin antibiotic product that we use. All right, I think we got our I think we're set. Alright, so I'm standing in front of our lambing pens, and you can probably say this don't look like lambing pens right now because they're filled with. So, what we have over here are side out panels that we use during lambing. So, what we're going to do is take these and put them somewhere that's not here. But we're gonna stack them on the side of the barn this year because when we need these panels for lambing, setting up lambing pens, oftentimes it's at three in the morning, you need to get them quickly and it's raining out and you gotta just bring them in. So we're gonna stack them on the side of the barn this time and see so it's quick to get to. Um, these pallets have nothing to do with lambing, but they have everything to do with the way we store hay. We put the bales of hay on these pallets that's why they're in here. We also have pallets in our main storage barn. So what I'm going to do is take these and put them, stack them up vertically in the in the K barn, so 
so they're not in the way when we bring new hay in the summer. And then when we're done with that, we'll have empty pens and we'll have to clean out all the loose stuff on the bottom so that they're ready, fresh and clean and ready for, to put straw in for lambs. So that's what we have to do for, over the next hour, is have this cleaned. Well, this is what we call our north lambing pen. It's in the main barn. It was our original pen. In fact, this door is, um, we moved from the other house. I built this when we first got in the Shetland Sheep. And it's actually supposed to be a creep feeder. These boards actually slide out so the lamps could run through. Well, those Shetlands are so small, our users are running through them too. So, um, haven't really used it for that since then. It's a very heavy gate, but it's one of the few things I moved from our other house to here when we built this house. So, we call this our Cadillac pen. It's the best one, it's the biggest one. So, and it's also the most protected. It's not because if you, we haven't looked at the one by the south side, but wind blows in the door and then right on the lambs when they're freshly born. This one they're fully protected so they don't have to worry about if they're wet or it's cold out. Um, this is a good place to put them. So, we got to get this crap out of here, including the bedding. Uh, scrape that down to the floor and then this one will be ready to go. That's pretty much all we have to do. Um, the only thing I like about this pen is there was a, we set it up so we could hang the heat lamp in here. So not only are they protected if we need a, need a heat lamp, which we don't use very often, but if we do need it, it's protected. I don't need the, the wind's not gonna be blowing it around. I can put it up high enough that the U's not gonna get into it. Um, it's just the best pen that we have. Okay, this is a, our, in the main barn, this is our south pen. I also moved this from the other house. This was, I built in the other house and there was a, there was a lambing pen. Back then we only had a few sheep, so we only needed one, one, one or two lambing pens. I think we had two. Um, one of them was the door we just showed you. Uh, I hate this one. Uh, it gets the job done, but it's right here by the main door. So on a hot day, it's perfect because you get a lot of air ventilation. So we keep the doors open. As long as it's not too windy, which in May it usually isn't too bad, it, it works out really well. In March or April, when it's cold at night or cold during the day, it doesn't work out as well because it's you know, cold air running in. And day you gotta have those doors open so the sheep can get in and out, the main yeah, clock. So during right? the day, the doors have to stay open because we don't keep the sheep locked in all day. Mm -hmm. So this is always a, a touchy pen. We use it. Um, when we get into heavy lambing, we need every pen we can get, and then usually we have to build supplemental pens as well. So we need every one we can use. This one I don't like. I'd like to replace these panels with Seidel panels. Um, but it served its purpose. It's, you know, this is what, 21 years old. We've used it. Now, 21, uh, yeah, probably 21 lambing seasons. It's coming this year. This one also needs to get cleaned out, but it's not as bad. During lambing, we install Wi-Fi cameras in the barn so that we can view all the activity on our television, our phones, or any of our devices, our iPads. I can actually look at them on my laptop when I'm in my office working on stuff. And what is required for those to work, the Wi-Fi cameras, is a really strong, stable signal. So we could hardwire a line from the house to the barn from our cable box, but what we decided to do instead was to purchase this device here. This is a Wi-Fi extender, and we bought it from a company called Netgear, 
And this particular one is designed so that the signal, the Wi-Fi signal is transferred through the actual power cables, the copper cables. And I have a um, transmitter that's plugged into the outlet at the house. And then that sends the Wi-Fi signal to this receiver. And then I have a pretty good stable signal in the barn. And that's how the Wi-Fi cameras operate. Um, so I want to show you just how we install the cameras and to set up. It's pretty easy. Once you set them up initially, you know, it's straightforward. We take them down after lambing is done, when we're done watching the activity in the barn, just because it's kind of dusty and I don't want to get the cameras damaged from that. I have a video I did last year in more detail about the Netgear system and where to get it and exactly which model we use because there's a lot of different models. Um, and this one, like I said, is very particular because it does work through the, the wiring, the house wiring. And that's the other thing that's important is the house and the barn are on the same meter and that's important. If you've got a separate meter for your barn, this system will not work. So those are the brackets. We left them up there. And so all you gotta do is just um, twist the base on. We decided to go with um, cameras that you plug in. Um, so we, they have a battery version you can get. We decided not to do that. This is um, just set, plugging it in. And we initialized it last year, got it hooked up to our Wi-Fi, so we didn't have to do that again this year. So the setup was really simple. Um, the camera actually gets itself set up. It sort of takes a, a scan of the barn. You can see it doing it here. It's kind of weird, but it does it on its own after you plug it in. And then once it goes through this little process, it's ready to go. And we were able to use it and to transmit it to the television and all our devices perfectly well. Hello, I want to start off today just by saying welcome to anybody that's new that hasn't seen any of our videos before and to thank returning viewers for taking the time out to watch this content. I really appreciate it and I hope that you enjoy it. In this video I'm going to be talking about my progress with the polypay breed study and I'm going to just dive right in. So there's a couple things to tell you. Number one is I've created a spreadsheet, which is kind of my thing. It's gonna help me to break apart the fiber into the different groups for the different ways I wanna process it and use the wool. So I took out a small piece of this to be micron tested. And so what's left here is this washed fiber. So that, so I've weighed this and it was 32.4 grams. And, and then I have to break it up into four different piles of wool. The first one is for dyeing and I'm, I've just said I'm gonna dye three grams of fiber. That'll leave me then with 9.8 grams for each prep I wanna do, which is flicking, combing, and carding. And then the spreadsheet breaks it down. It's gonna also take a record for the combing and the flicking of how much waste came out, and I'll weigh that. Um, and then whatever's left, that whatever weight is left will then get either spun on the spindle or spun on the wheel. And I've got that split up into the two weights for the plying so that I only spin up as much as I need for each ply. And then what I'm going to do is the, the yarn that I spin on the wheel, I'm going to use that for knitting. So I'm going to make a little square or whatever. The 
the combed fiber that I spin on the spindle, I'm gonna use that um, to weave with. So that'll be another segment, me playing around with the loom. The stuff that I hand card into roll eggs, so that's gonna get spun on the wheel. I'm gonna spin that woolen. And then I'm gonna take those, take that fiber to ply it and then crochet a swatch with that. So that's, that's one thing I created. I spent a little bit of time on that this week. So yeah, so here's my washed fiber. So another thing I have came up with, I'm gonna be using these horrible, wretched, abominable plastic containers from takeout or baked goods that we get at the store. And that's where I'm gonna put the different fiber preps. So I'm gonna weigh out 9.8 grams. And this one is designated for the fiber I wanna comb. So, this is my little digital scale. Okay, so it's at zero, which is good. So it's now at 29.6, but that's because I took out three grams for the dyeing. So for this 29.6 or whatever, I need to come up with 9.8 grams. And I'm gonna put that in my little container here to be combed. 6.2. Eight. Point six. I'm being very cautious. Nine point nine. Nine point six. All right, so that's good enough. So nine point nine. That's going to go into my container that I have labeled comb, and I will comb this. Such a dork, I know. Okay, then another. Section of 9.8. That's 8.3. Okay, yeah, that is gonna work out. Seems like this was a lot more. Nine point one nine point nine again, and then this one is nine point eight. Okay, now I'm going to put this in my flicking container. And I picked this one because I, the locks are a little bit more intact. This one got a little bit fluffy, so I'll just use that on the hand cards to do the woolen prep, the roll eggs. Throwing out a lot of words. <laughs> All right, so there's the flicked stuff. And this is the stuff that I prep with my hand cards. And then here's the three grams for the dyeing. It's just a small amount here. 2.9, close enough. And I'm gonna be using Kool-Aid. I bought some orange Kool-Aid on Sweeten. I got some information from my friend Kim at Fairly Fiber Fun on how to use the microwave with a Ziploc bag, so I wanted to keep it really simple. So I'm gonna I'll do a video next week where I start with some white Corydale I have just to experiment and try, figure out how much exactly of the powder I need to use to dye such a small amount of fiber. So that's, that'll be it coming up. All right. So there you go, I got the wool for carding. Using the combs. Flicking and combing. All right, so now what I wanna do is I wanna get to work 
on prepping these. So that'll be the next step. I'll talk a little bit about the tools I'm going to be using. So the flicking tools I use is my Magicraft flicker. I really like this flicker. The tines are in there so well. It's just really well made. I've used other flickers and the tines get really loose and wobbly and they break off and stuff and this this one is just really great and I like the handle design. So this is what I'm going to use for flicking. Um, for combing I have two pitch mini combs that are also Magicraft. Because it's such a small quantity I'm not going to deal with the bench clamp. So I'll be using these. And one of the benefits of using the combs I just realized as I was cleaning all these before I made the video is it there's you know it's easy to clean these those hand carters which these are the ones I'm going to be using you really got to clean them really well because everything that you take off of the hand cards you're going to spin with there's no waste whereas with the combs there's a good amount of waste but um the two pitches for finer wools but it, uh, we'll see. I mean, well, maybe I'll observe that this isn't going to work if I use it on the polypay. The polypay, the samples I have, I don't think, I don't see those as being super fine. I think they're more in the high 20s, low 30s. Um, and then, yeah, so I got the hand cards here. I've had these, this, these are my first cards I ever bought. They're Ashford. They're a little heavy, and I, st I used them at first, not realizing that the prep you get with hand cards isn't really what I liked to spin. Um, you know, it's more you, you're going to make roll eggs and then spin in a woolen technique. And then, yeah, the other thing, you really got to get them clean from prior preps because, you know, that'll get into your spinning. And then with the Shetland, obviously, I've got all the different colors. So I just, I had, I was carding black wool on this. And now I'm going to go to white wool, so I really had to like get in there with the knitting needle to get out everything. Magicraft does have hand cards. I just can't keep them in stock long enough for me to get my own set. So I've got a massive order of hand cards in. Hopefully that will <laughs> stay in inventory. And then I'll be able to use those. Um, they're a lot lighter than traditional hand cards. So, so those are the three tools I'll be using in my fiber prep. Of the, the different breeds I'm doing. So this is the fiber I am going to be flicking. I am noticing a few of these little, I don't know if they're second cuts or just little nips that are coming out. And that's probably, I mean, that's nothing to do with the breed, right? That's shearing. There's my lock, quite a bit longer. interesting. I'm really interested to see where I end up with the amount of waste between combing and flicking because I I'm always under the assumption that combing yields the most waste. So we're going to find out and I don't know that I comb perfectly. My technique isn't probably the best. So that's the flicking. And again, we're saving all the waste because I'm going to weigh that at the end when I get that all finished. I should have used a bigger container for this. Okay, carding. I 
I don't need the leather. I'll just leave it on here. So yeah, like I said before, with the hand cards, they don't, you don't have waste. So you really wanna make sure that whatever you put on the cards is what you want in your wool or, you know, plan on cleaning your wool as you spin, which I hate doing. I find that extremely tedious. I like to rip off the tips instead of cutting them because I feel like I don't pull off as much. I'm really only pulling off the dead, broken bits. So yeah, so any if there is any little second cuts or anything, they're in there. Right now I'm only I'm doing one fleece, a black fleece like this, just because it's really short. So I can't flick it, so I'm spinning a woolen prep with that. I like how the ends get kind of bumpy and lumpy. So tech, this is really how I do it. I don't make roll eggs. I'll just take this and You don't want your fibers lined up when you're doing the woolen long dry. You want it kind of jumbled up like this, so. There's that for the or carding, 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 carding. fairly early on Sunday morning here. I still have to go outside and feed the animals. It is April 10th and it's snowing outside. So this is normally here in western New York we'll get a snow fall mid-April and I think this might be it and then I think we're done with snow. October. Yeah, see, I don't Ooh. have great technique here. Keeps on getting on there. Go side to side. Maybe. So this is how I, I, I just will kind of go side to side. Nest number one. waste. Probably could have got something out of that one. I'm going to put that back on. Ouch. <laughs> one of the things about the Magicraft combs that's good is that these tines aren't super sharp. So like what I just did, probably on some other combs you would have gotten a little pinprick, but with these it's just a little 
Ow. Wasted air. I feel like combing is kind of a a violent process. <laughs> Even like when you put the wool on the combs, they call it lashing. I don't know, I feel like that's kind of... <laughs> a little harsh. Okay, there's my waist. Yep, I would say that's legitimate waist. All right, so those are the three methods. So I'm going to finish up with that and then we will get spinning. In this segment, I'm going to update you on my ruining activity, but I wanted to first talk about a poll I put up on my YouTube channel, and um, it was about, you know, how do you identify as a fiber person or as a person that watches the content on my channel, which is, in my, the way I describe it, it's about raising sheep for their wool. And that, everything around that. So I got 59 responses to the poll, which I was pretty happy about. And I asked the question, I actually set it up in two polls, so it could be pretty flawed. People may have responded on both or whatever, but it's okay. So 59 responded, and of them, 16 were spindlers. And I didn't put a definition on that, but to me, a spindler is somebody that uses the drop spindle. And so 16 of the viewers that responded to the poll identify as a spindler if they had to pick one. 14 came up as spinners, which I kind of means, you know, spinning on a spinning wheel. 14 identify as knitters. Six is farmers, which I find that interesting because I know I've got a lot of viewers that are more interested in the animals and the husbandry and learning about how we do things on the farm. Six are crocheters and three just identify as animal lovers. So they just enjoy watching the kittens and the sheep and lambs. So I thought I would share that with you. I will write this down and put it in the comment section of this video. But today I also want to talk about rooing. So rooing is an activity you do with your sheep, your primitive sheep that have a break in the fleece, usually in the spring when the weather starts to get warm. And this weak spot in the fleece it's called, a, what do we call it? We call it the break in the wool. It doesn't happen with every Shetland, but it happens with many of our Shetlands. And what happens is because there's that weak spot, you can harvest the wool by pulling it off of the sheep rather than having to use shears and clippers. And it's a different type of fleece. You know, it's got um, pretty much, got it. pretty much the entire fleece is as nature intended. So there's no second cuts. There's no, you know, um, leftover fiber from last year on the tip. It's pretty, it's, I call it pristine. So, so I'm brewing as many sheep as I can this year. My flock, I should have my numbers here for this, but roughly the flock right now is at like 65 sheep. And my shearer is coming next Sunday, the 17th of April. And I told him he was going to have 40 sheep to shear. And it's important to give your shearer the number of sheep they're going to shear so they can plan. Um, because he's doing a number of farms that day that are in the area. So anyway, so he's got 40 sheep and I'm going to be ruining 20 plus or minus. It's difficult because I have more than 20 sheep that I could rue and I prefer to rue. Um, so I'm identifying them. We started out just doing lambs because it was too cold and I didn't want my bread used to be dealing with cold temperatures while they're trying to use their calories for you know, staying fit for lambing. So I was doing a bunch of lambs. Just yesterday I did a couple of bread ewes and it seems to me like the bread ewes are ruining better. They have a bigger break, bigger break. They've got a weaker break, which makes it easier for me to, to rue them. And when we did um, CDTs in the bread use a couple weeks ago, I actually made a note on a sheet of paper with the list of all the sheep, which ones I would rue 
I just did a quick test and then kept track of that. So that's what I'm using as my guide when I go out and select the sheep to, to work on that day. Okay, so what I just wanted to do today is go through the fleeces that I've rued. So the first thing I want to show you is the stuff, the wool from our Ophelia. These are the cards I make to keep track, and these go in the clear plastic bags with each fleece. So Ophelia was, she's a gray cat mugget, you lamb, not was, she is. Um, she brewed really easily. She's very sweet, very friendly. And um, I, right now what I'm doing is I'm just ruining the wool that's directly under the coat because I'm trying to target my hand spinners, trying to get the full assortment of fleeces done so that after shearing is done, I can go through all those, identify the ones I want to sell the hand spinners, and then just the rude portion of the fleeces that I would sell the hand spinners. I actually leave the neck and the bridge and the belly on the sheep I'm growing right now just because I want to get the hand spinner fleece wool off of them. So Ophelia, I got uh, 20.8 ounces of fiber from her. She's a lamb, so that's not, it's not a lot. That's a small fleece, but pretty good for a lamb. And I also have to remember when I do these weights, I'm not including the neck and the bridge and the belly wool. Um, so then after I washed it, I got 14.4 ounces, which is about a 30% shrinkage. Which isn't, it's not bad. This is what the fleece looks like. I've picked over this a lot because I've been working on this. So this is the, the back side of the fleece. And you can see it's got real like cloudy where the base is. And that's just from you know me pulling it off of the sheep. And I work really hard when I'm rowing to keep the whole fleece intact, at least one half so that the tips, if you wanted to process it by flicking it or combing it, you can grab the tips fairly easily. I decided to process this fleece myself just because, A, I haven't had a fleece to process in a long time because I sold most of them and then worked through a lot of them, well, all of them before this coming shearing day. The other reason is their staple length is a little on the short side, and so I opted to process this myself. So what I did was I washed it very lightly. It still has quite a bit of lanolin. And the tips that are very coiled, any of the fiber where the tips are like this, really coiled and curly, I sp I'm spinning that in a, a single locks on my jumbo bobbin using my Aura Hybrid Flyer on my rows. So filling up a jumbo bobbin of that, and then any of the portions of the fleece where it's not quite as tippy and well-defined, and maybe a little bit more matte. Let me see if I can find an example of that. Yeah, kind of more like this, where there's a little bit more, there's more length there as well. Those I'm flicking and spinning into a really pretty lace weight, on a standard bobbin with just the standard e-flyer to get the nice thin. Then I'm plying those together, coming up with a really fun bumbly, I call this the bumbly yarn, where you can see some of the coiled bits are coming through. This makes a really cute hat, a nice trim. And I'm hoping to get three skeins from our dear Ophelia. So that's this stuff. So I'll put that all back in here. <laughs> okay, so that's her. So now the other ones I haven't done anything with, so I'm just gonna go through them one by one and show them to you. And also mark them on while I'm at it. This one I just harvested yesterday. And this is from Aria. And yes, I do raw fleeces in my kitchen. I don't know. <laughs> Doesn't bother me. This is a little bit damp. I probably should leave this out because it did, it was raining yesterday. So Aria is a black U. She's a Game of Thrones year. I'll have to 
to bow. I have to put notes on because I don't know. And um, just a beautiful rich black. She's got one really cool white spot on her. Anyway, so here is the fleece from beautiful Aria. And we coated them a lot earlier this year, so I'm not, I don't have as much bleach tips as I normally do. Let me just get a little piece. Super nice. Incredibly fine. You know. So I did both sides of her. She root really easily. All right, I've got this on set for ounces. I'm gonna leave it in the bag just because it's easier to weigh. So Aria is an adult, so she's gonna have a bigger fleece. And I've got that at 22 ounces total. Huh. That's not much more than uh, Ophelia. So I put the year on the left. Top part of the card. And it's Aria. And I don't know where your tag number. I'll get that eventually. But I just wanted to keep this marked. And then it just goes in the bag with the writing side out so that when it's up on the shelf, I can see it. If I need to pull it down for whatever reason. So that's her. I'll feel you over there. The cord on my scale is too short. There, I guess that's good. Okay. The next one is Cordelia. And I think I only did a half of her. She's a white you lamb. I did a video of her ruin. The white fleeces, you know, they show the dirt a lot better. Piece of hay. <laughs> Just glorious. And um, really good staple length too on old Cordelia. Very, very fine. Nice lock structure. I'm really happy with this one. I'm gonna get a weight in the bag. And I only did one half of her. She brewed really easy, so one of the days where my arms are particularly tired, but I'm not ready to come in yet, I will work on her. So this is 7.5 on the one side. So once the fleece sale is done, and I'm going to be doing an auction this year, I've got the app figured out and stuff. See that. Once the fleece auction is done and all the fleeces have shipped, then I'm going to go back out and finish ruling all the ones that I was going to ruin, and then decide what I'm going to do with the wool I harvest from those, whether I'm going to comb top them or process them myself or whatever. Next up is Paulina. This is the little black you, the only black you I got last year, lamb. So that was pretty tragic. I was very disappointed. But I did get her, and she's lovely, out of Locola. Also a solid black you. And this one is. 15.9 for one side. Did I say Paulina? The wool has just fallen off her neck too. I think I did both sides of her because she root so easily and I did video this one. I don't video all, all of them. Just it's Sometimes you just want to do something and not spend time fiddling with the camera and everything. That's Paulina. 
all of her gorgeousness. I thought I saw a lock. She doesn't have a very long staple length either, but it's not too bad. But these super fine. She, you, after you comb them out, they get a little bit longer. But it's like Rich says, you know, the finer they are, the shorter. And that's the that's the, one of the goals for us breeding to get the fineness that stays over the years. Gertrude. So this is one I just did a couple days ago, and she was not enthusiastic. 6.8 ounces for one side. A gray cat mugget lamb. Super duper fine. This is um, Lakshmi's lamb. I don't talk about Lakshmi that much. Lakshmi's a gray cat mugget. It's beautiful. And this is, it just feels unbelievably nice. So I did one side off of her and it was a struggle. So I, I gotta do the other side, I'm committed now. She kicked up a little bit of a fuss. I'm trying to get it so I can. That's the tips side. When I put these up for sale, I show both sides tip and the base. And these rude fleeces, they got those little clouds on the base. And that's just like from the, you know, the resistance from when you're pulling it. It's like a snapping when it comes off and that's it sort of snaps back into that form. Okay, so I already weighed it. Let's just take a look at a lock. Very, very silky. That was Gertrude. Again, I didn't put the... You guys gotta keep an eye on me. <laughs> okay, so I got three more to go. Point seven Viola seven point six one side. This is um, Genoa's ewe lamb. She's a gray cat mugget. Also, we had a lot of gray cat muggets last year, and she's the one. Viola's the one that's got the spotting on her face. She's pretty friendly, but she's also very demanding. If I don't pet her when she wants me to pet her, she'll like paw at me and. Bam me. She's kind of a stinker. But I love her. So this is the base of her wool. One of the things I learned doing the WAP sales, wool and fiber artists, it's an online live sale, is you don't move don't move your stuff. Just let it hold it still. They always tell you that, give you that direction. She's got a really nice dark patch on her fleece. You can see there's some dark and then there's some light. Let me see that is Viola is her name. Let's just take a look at a lock. Nice, nice length. That's a good one. I like that. For those of you that wanted to, you know, comb it and spin it worsted. These shorter ones are nice for a woolen spin. I actually am getting to the point now, especially the rude ones, because you know there's no neps or noils, and everything is you know so together. They're so nice. Seven point six ounces on the one side, but that was not an easy row either. It was kind of a rough one. Okay. Another side to go on her. What do we have here. Perdita. So she's the last gray cat mugget that we had last year, lamb. 
I love her fiber. It's so dark, nice and dark. Even her lighter bits on her body are dark. And so, I'm pretty sure this is just one side. She's got a really dense fleece. Yeah, 10.2 for just one side. She's got sort of a bolder crimp as I'm looking at it. A darker lock so we can really see oh that's yeah this is weird this is something that's sort of weird it's got a bolder crimp at the top and then it gets finer as it goes down into the base perdita is pretty you know, they'll remember to put the card in there this time She did not root super easy, but she did well, though. She's a good girl. She's one of my friendlies, too. Whoops. Kind of like Viola in that she's friendly, but she's also really demanding. Did I do a brown? I had a brown you, I thought I did. Amelia, I'll have to go out and see if that's out there in the garage. I storm in the garage. Okay, this is Velva. She's white. She's a uh, 2020. You. Very, very sweet. And we put her with a ram. But it doesn't. I rooted her yesterday, and it didn't strike me that she looked bred, but. She's a first timer, and sometimes they trick you. And I think I only did the hat for her. This is really a nice one. I sold her fleece last year. I rooted her last year and sold her fleece raw. 15.2 for one side. She's Harry's sister, Harry's the ram that we use. We've used the last two years in breeding. This, this place is incredibly dense. This is a really nice, this is what we want right here, this girl. That's the skin side, very billowy and lofty. Beautiful. And now, like I said, the white ones do show the dirt. So even though they got coats, we don't coat them right away, so there's a little bit of dirt on the very tip, which is, you know, why you wash them. <laughs> oh, Belva, you're so lovely. Such a pretty girl. Nice length. It's really good. So that one's probably gonna go to a hand spinner. Probably will be put in the auction. Oh, it's just so lovely. Now I'm gonna run out to the garage because I know I did Amelia and she got in this stack, so I don't know what I did with her. And I'll be right back. She fell behind the cabinet that I used. That would have been weird. All right, so here is Amelia. So she's the brown spotted you from last year. Oh man, I can't pick a favorite. She does have a very bold crimp at the tip, but it gets finer towards the base. Which I don't know what that's about. Lamb, baby, wool versus as they get older. Scale still on. 5.6. She's on this small side. I was looking at her yesterday. She's little. But flashy. Real pretty girl.
I mean, I keep on saying it's super fine. Everything we have is super fine. I just, I don't know why I keep saying that. So. All right, so I'm making progress. I'm trying to do at least one a day. So if I do a half of one, I do two halves and get two used up on the stand. And I want to do that because I just want to get a feel if one is really easy or difficult so that I can plan ahead for based on how my hands and arms feel, how much time I have, etc. So there's where we are right now. Getting very excited. <laughs> all right, it's just all this, you know, the whole year goes right to this time. It's the, the actual harvesting of the wool. It's what it's all about. So it's, it's a really important time for the farm.